Uh, thank you all for being here, and it's a great uh, privilege and honor, and also challenge to follow Roger. So it's, it, his talks are so interesting. I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've done together: uh, anesthesia, consciousness, Bohm, and Penrose. Now, both David Bohm and Roger Penrose have uh, invoked uh, quantum quantum effects in consciousness. Uh, David Bohm by equating uh, more or less uh, the mental and physical to uh, his implicate and explicate orders and uh, also describing conscious thought as distributed and non-local. And of course, Roger has invoked uh, objective reduction as a solution to the measurement problem in causing, uh, resulting in consciousness rather than consciousness causing collapse, 180 degrees uh, differently. And in the background of this slide, you see a neuron with uh, the uh, yellow of the microtubules that I'll be talking about. And most views of the brain look at neurons strictly from the surface. All this money for brain mapping is looking just at surface. Uh, it's kind of like looking at all of medicine through dermatology, and I think that's a big mistake. So we're going to uh, go inside the neuron a little bit. But first ask, uh, what is consciousness? And uh, we take it for granted that when we uh, open our eyes, um, uh, the world out there appears inside our heads. Uh, Bing, if you will, and Bing during this talk will, will mean uh, having subjective conscious experience. And it's approached through various uh, modalities, neuroscientists, uh, neuroscience, artificial intelligence, art, aesthetics, uh, physics, uh, Schrodinger's cat, psychiatry, anesthesia, and that looks a little bit like me, and I'm going to talk about uh, anesthesia as a tool to understand consciousness, meditation, and uh, philosophy. But let's, let's talk a little bit about anesthesia. It's what I've been doing uh, uh, to earn my living for 43 years, and I wrote a chapter in uh, this book at the Millennium on the greatest invention, supposedly, of the past uh, mil uh, 2,000 years, and anesthesia is first, alphabetically at least, and when you think about it, it's a, great, uh, it's a great thing, because imagine if we didn't have it, and you broke your leg or burst your appendix, uh, things would be a lot different, your outlook would be a lot different. Um, so what do we know about anesthesia, and what can, what can it tell us about consciousness? Because under, under anesthesia, the brain is still active. What's gone is consciousness. The brain is still active. We use evoke, we use evoke potentials to uh, look at spine integrity and so forth. So um, in the 1900s, uh, uh, some gases were discovered which at low concentration uh, caused uh, euphoria and giddiness. And here we see laughing gas, li uh, living made easy. And this is politically very incorrect uh, prescriptions for scolding wives. Just give them some uh, nitrous oxide. And uh, uh, subsequently, ether was used for ether frolics. Um, but at higher concentrations, uh, subjects became unconscious. And uh, if you don't go too far, they kept on breathing and, and woke up when you, when you removed it. And this was used uh, for surgery under anesthesia. And this is the first successful anesthesia in, at the Mass General in Boston. Now, uh, in the 19th century, it was discovered that uh, breathing certain gases, and we're all breathing gases right now, uh, uh, roughly 80% uh, nitrogen, 20% uh, oxygen, then a, a mixture, a small mixture of a bunch of other gases. And they found these other gases that uh, uh, when mixed with air or oxygen, you still need oxygen, uh, immobilized or anesthetized all animals studied. Mammals, amphibians, insects, fish, worms, even plants can be anesthetized. And strangely, the gases varied tremendously in chemical structure and included ethers, halogenated hydrocarbons, nitrous oxide, and the inert element xenon, which isn't shown here. Chemically quite different, had the same, same effect. And the necessary concentration uh, breathing when equilibrated in lungs, blood, and brain to immobilize or anesthetize all the animals was precisely the same for each gas, from insects to elephants. At equilibrium, it takes the same amount of anesthesia to put a horse or a cow or a pig to sleep as it does a human or an insect or a salamander. It's, it's quite amazing. This became known as the minimal alveolar concentration, or MAC, inversely related to potency. The more anesthetic you need, the higher the MAC, the weaker the anesthetic. Now, a common factor was sought for this seemingly unitary mode of anesthesia among disparate chemical structures. And uh, such a factor was found at the turn of the 20th century related to solubility, where these anesthetics would, would bind or dissolve in the body. And it, it turned out to relate on the old saying, oil and water don't mix.
Uh, Hans Meyer in 1897 and Charles Overton in 2001, working independently, looked at a whole bunch of gases with a whole bunch of animals and uh, over time put this uh, graph together uh, in which the, they found that the potency of an anesthetic uh, shown on the, uh, on the left is, is max. So the, the higher the max, the weaker the anesthetic. So the lower here, uh, the stronger the anesthetic, methoxyflurin being the most potent anesthetic, was linearly proportional over many, many orders of magnitude to solubility in olive oil. So the more, the more soluble in olive oil, the more potent the anesthetic. Uh, this seemed very strange. Now, to, if you think about it, if you uh, look at the, the body or the brain, as pharmacologists do, as a, as a uh, collection of uh, compartments, of uh, solubility compartments, you could uh, you grind up a body, if you will, and put it in a, a bunch of different containers. Then you would see uh, uh, and, and put, plot it on, this, uh, on this, this graph where going this way is more polar. So out here would be polar solvents like water or blood. So something out here would be highly soluble in the blood. Moving this way, less soluble in blood, but highly soluble in fat and oily tissues, including the brain. The brain has a lot of uh, 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 material that is, is oil-like or nonpolar. So that means that anesthesia acts and consciousness therefore arises from areas that are highly nonpolar, like aromatics and aliphatics, shown here, uh, xylene, toluene, and benzene. This is where anesthesia binds and acts, and presumably where consciousness arises. Now, how would that happen? Well, specifically, anesthetics bind it by quantum level van der Waals London forces in regions of the oil like regions of Hildebrand solubility coefficient lambda of 15.2 to 19.3 uh, units, indicating a nonpolar environment akin to olive oil uh, with pi electron resonance clouds. Now, pi resonance rings, this is the uh, uh, familiar six sided carbon ring, the basis for organic chemistry. We're made of these kinds of rings. Uh, life is dependent on these kinds of, of rings with, with three extra electron, uh, w uh, which aren't shown here, but they form these electron clouds, resonance clouds, called pi resonance above and below the ring. And you form this uh, non-local, delocalized cloud of electrons uh, above and below the ring. And these rings, these clouds, support electric and magnetic dipole oscillations, excitons, charge transfer, pho phonons, fluorescence, London force dipoles, and spin states. So this is where the quantum stuff happens, or can happen. Now, if we take two uh, of these uh, rings by themselves, uh, benzene, for example, or phenyl rings, they're called in biology, they tend to attract by van der Waals uh, attractions, London forces, and they get to a, a critical distance called the van der Waals radiance, radius, and the electrons in one form a cloud which repels the other cloud, and these clouds oscillate back and forth in terahertz at ambient temperature, Kt, at 10 to the 12th. This is terahertz oscillations. So if you put these things together, they're going to oscillate in terahertz. Now, if you take most most biomolecules are amphipathic, so they have a nonpolar ring with the three extra electron clouds, and then a polar tail with charges that might uh, bind in water, and uh, they, so they have the nonpolar rings and the polar uh, tails, and they tend to uh, coalesce. Oil and water don't mix, and the the nonpolar rings stick together and form by van der Waals forces and form kind of a delocalized uh, region or a region of uh, delocalized electron clouds. Uh, that are called micelles, and, uh, and with the polar sticking out to be soluble in water. And operin, back in the 1920s, I believe, called these micelles as a first form of cells, and this may have been how biological systems formed, and proteins fold in this way. They have a nonpolar region inside that, uh, that's oil-like and a polar region on the outside. Also, lipid bilayers, membranes, have the uh, very similar with the nonpolar uh, regions in the middle and the polar tail sticking outside the cell and inside the cell. And nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, the same thing with a pie stack where the, the purines and pyrimidines line up. So lipids, uh, uh, lipid membranes, nucleic acids, proteins all have this nonpolar interior conducive to quantum effects on the interior, which means that a quantum underground underlies biomolecules and living states in general, since all the major biomolecules have this inside. So the mystery of quantum biology may be solved by the fact that it's happening in, deep inside the cells where it's hard to probe uh, and away from polar charges that might cause uh, decoherence. 
Also, uh, molecules that are uh, psychoactive that cause uh, mental state changes, including neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin have these uh, aromatic rings, these pyrescence rings, as do the psychedelic drugs, LSD, DMT, and psilocybin. They have these, uh, these pyrescence clouds, and they cause uh, altered uh, mental states, the opposite of, of anesthesia. You might think that they expand consciousness. So then the question is, in which biomolecules and cell structures do anesthetics act? Uh, there's a long uh, history of this research. Uh, in 1846, Claude Bernard showed that amoeba, here's an amoeba in the background, which streams along amoeboid movement, uh, that the amoeboid, uh, the cytoplasmic streaming and amoeboid movement was reversibly inhibited by the anesthetic chloroform. You, you put chloroform over it and it stopped moving and you blew it off and it, it uh, resumed moving. And this was shown in the 30s to be due to effect on the cytoplasm inside the the cell rather than on the membrane. Uh, in uh, 1968, uh, Allison and Nunn, John Nunn from, uh, from the UK, uh, uh, tested effects of anesthetics on microtubules using this, uh, this organism, uh, Actinospherium, which has all these spiky things coming out, axonemes, and if you cross-cut uh, one of them, you see that they're made of these double helical arrays of microtubules. I'll tell you a little bit more about microtubules sub subsequently. And they found that in the presence of halothane, that these axonemes disappear, they dissolve, they depolymerize, the microtubules disassembled. And they published in Lancet that anesthesia was due to depolymerization of microtubules. Uh, however, and fortunately, uh, that occurs at about five times the amount of anesthetic required to put uh, anyone or any animal to sleep, five max. So at, at proper anesthetic concentrations, it's very unlikely that anesthesia is depolymerizing anyone's microtubules. However, repeated anesthetics in elderly people tend to cause Alzheimer's like dementia. So it may be that repeated and excessive use of anesthetic uh, over, over time may actually contribute to your microtubules falling apart. So take care of your microtubules. Now, how did, uh, so that was not accepted as a theory of, of anesthesia, but uh, uh, in, the in the most of the 20th century, people realized that the membranes were, uh, were excitable, and, uh, and, they th and since anesthetics were uh, lipid soluble, uh, uh, they, it was assumed that anesthetics get into the lipid phase and, and block excitability of membranes, but then it was realized that, that proteins uh, are responsible for the excitability of, of membranes. Uh, and Jim Trudell, among others, tried to rescue the lipid uh, hypothesis by saying anesthetics act in the lipid phase and prevented ion channels from opening and closing. Well, that turned out to be wrong also because those effects could be mimicked by a slight temperature change. Uh, so uh, subsequently, uh, Nick Franks and Bill Lieb at, uh, here in London showed that uh, anesthetics acted directly on proteins by acting in nonpolar hydrophobic regions inside them with the, uh, these pi resonance clouds with the en uh, enzyme luciferin, which gave off light. So they were able to measure light emission with and without anesthetic and found a nice Meyer-Overton correlation directly without any membranes uh, in, the, in the picture. So therefore, uh, anesthetics can act directly on proteins. So at that point in time, there was a fork in the road. Uh, uh, scientists in the anesthetic mechanism uh, field could go, back to, could go back to cytoskeletal proteins like Claude Bernard and, and John Nunn or membrane proteins. But uh, uh, most of the field went towards membrane proteins and looked for effects of uh, anesthetics on, uh, on receptors for serotonin, glycine, acetylcholine, and GABA-A receptors, the most common uh, receptors. Uh, Nick Franks was responsible for this, for both the, the gases and other anesthetics, propofol, etomidate, and ketamine. But to make a long story short, it didn't work. There was a mixed bag. Some would make them more excitable, some less excitable, some didn't bind at all. And uh, this editorial said they were a double-edged sword. They could both stimulate and excite. And in a series of papers uh, in, the, in, two, in the 2000s, a bunch of papers basically kind of gave up on the idea that anesthetics act on membrane proteins. In 2006, 2008, a group at Penn began to study systematically anesthetic actions and found that uh, they bind to about 70 different proteins in neurons, half in the membrane, half in the cytoplasm. And this group at uh, Penn, Eckenhoff, Eckenhoff's group, showed that uh, using genomics and proteomics uh, that the effects seemed to be on, mostly on, on, on tubulin with some other proteins, neither of which were involved in signaling. So um, there, the proteomics and genomics pointed to microtubules. Uh, 
They also looked at uh, effects of this anesthetic, which is fluorescent, on movement of tadpoles uh, using optogenetics. And uh, the anesthetic is only active when illuminated with fluorescent light. When it fluoresces, so they get, and the tadpoles have conveniently transparent heads, so they can swim around. They illuminate them with the, with the ultraviolet light, and they would suddenly become anesthetized. And, uh, and, and uh, so they concluded that, and then they showed uh, that the anesthetic bound to the microtubules, uh, and they concluded that an this anesthetic at least acted on, on microtubules, consistent with our theory, which they call quantum mobility theory. Not quite the right name, but close enough. So anesthetics appear to specifically prevent consciousness by binding to microtubules. Where in the brain do anesthetics act on microtubules, and what do they do there? Well, uh, here's a slice of cortex, which is probably the most likely place. And inputs from thalamus go to uh, several layers, which all converge on layer five with these giant pyramidal cells. And uh, these are the most likely place for consciousness. Not that it might not involve other neurons, and, but um, the apical dendrites, which arise to the surface, give rise to EEG. And the output's axon go to move your arms and do things and, and uh, exert causal action in, in the world. And if we look inside these giant pyramidal neurons, we see uh, in, in, the, in the cell bodies microtubules, which are uniquely arrayed in mixed polarity networks of interrupted uh, networks. Now, uh, microtubules are part of the cytoskeleton. If you think they're there for structural support, uh, it would be a mystery why they're broken and interrupted. You wouldn't break your femur bone in half uh, for skeletal support. And they're also a mixed polarity pointing up and down uh, in, adjacently. And uh, this may be to optimize resonance and interference, uh, an idea that Roger came up with in one of our, our later uh, papers. So, um, uh, so the pyramidal cells are the best bet for uh, 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 source of consciousness and uh, anesthetic action. And uh, uh, if we look at tubulin, so here's a microtubule. And if we take one tubulin protein, we see that it has uh, eight, uh, serotonin, eight tryptophan rings, which have uh, these pi resonance clouds. And uh, this is very similar to the uh, pi resonance groups in photosynthesis proteins, which have been shown to uh, implement quantum coherence. So uh, there could be some similarity uh, there. And if we look more deeply at uh, tubulin, uh, in addition to the tryptophan shown in the, uh, the blue, and uh, looking at the phenyl uh, phenylalanine and tyrosine, all of which have uh, pi resonance, there's a total of 86 pi resonance groups in one tubulin. And in the red, you see where anesthetics bind. So anesthetics do bind uh, in a confluence of these groups. And this was shown by Travis Craddock and, and myself and others uh, in 2012. So anesthetics bind to tubulin. Uh, there's plenty of pi resonance there. Uh, so where do we go from there? Well, uh, I'm going to tell you about a recent study we did. And it started from the fact that in the 1990s, some other gases were discovered, oddball gases, which bind in nonpolar regions according to Meyer-Overton, but don't cause anesthesia or immobility. You give them to an animal, and we know they're bound in the same place as the anesthetics. The animals keep on uh, behaving and, and doing what they do. And they're called, uh, there's a couple of them, uh, F6 and trifluoromethylbenzene, and then another one which is both anesthetic and convulsant. It's a convulsant at low doses, but an anesthetic at regular doses. And these can be used to test effects of anesthesia because they're binding in the places where anesthetics bind, but they don't cause anesthesia. So um, here's all of them together. So in this study, we used uh, these eight anesthetics shown up here, these two non-anesthetics, and the one convulsive, and they're color-coded. So blue, uh, pink, and green. So we first showed that anesthetics, here's the reference from uh, uh, Nature Scientific Reports uh, 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 in late August. We first showed that anesthetics and non-anesthetics, which do bind to the site of anesthetic, anesthetic action, uh, correlate with potency and polarizability. That is to say, the non-anesthetics don't have any potency and, and don't have uh, changes in, in polarizability. So for example, here we plot uh, uh, MAC, the minimum alveolar concentration. So the lower the number, the more potent the anesthetic. Methoxyflurane, it's not methamphetamine, it's methoxyflurane, MOF, uh, is the most potent anesthetic. Uh, it's highly, highly soluble in, uh, in uh, uh, olive oil. And uh, the, the weakest, uh, which would be nitrous oxide, about 100%. At, uh, 100%. So you have to breathe almost 100% nitrous. Uh, you'd have to uh, do it at high pressure to add oxygen. But the uh, TFMB and the F6, which are not anesthetics, are off the charts in terms of MAC. Uh, 
10 times, 10 atmospheres, which is basically impossible. And the uh, convulsant anesthetic is right on the line because it is an anesthetic. So, okay, so that, so polarizability, uh, uh, which might affect uh, uh, pi resonance of, uh, bonds, uh, pi resonance clouds, is a key factor. So we learned that, and this pretty much tells us the same thing, that polarizability uh, uh, is off the charts and uh, doesn't correlate with potency. If you project this, you'd see where they're, uh, well, uh, the, uh, where it should be, but uh, it, they, don't, they don't have any effects. And uh, here's polarizability, polarizability versus uh, solubility. Okay, um, we then used uh, all this fancy uh, simulation, Travis Craddock and, and his colleagues, uh, binding site predictions, docking, quantum chemistry, and modeling, and found at, at KT that, uh, and we applied this to all 86, or they did, all 86 pi resonance groups in tubulin, and we found that at KT there was a spectrum of collective dipole oscillations among these 86 pi resonance groups in tubulin with a common mode peak at 613 terahertz, which is in the blue light region. It's not to say that, that the brain is giving off blue light. This is internal. There may not be photoexcited states, but uh, there's these oscillations in the, in the blue light region of the spectrum. We then looked at the, the same simulated effects of the eight anesthetics, the two non-anesthetics, and the one anesthetic convulsant on these collective dipole oscillations of all 86. And uh, this is uh, what we found. Now, this is a subtraction plot. We started with the, the spectrum uh, without any anesthetic or added gas, and then added the gas and took the difference. So what you see here is what, what, what is missing from the normal uh, spectrum for each anesthetic. And uh, so um, for desvalerine, for example, you can see the, the 613 peak uh, here, and 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 here, but it's missing from F6, and it's missing, uh, it actually goes up in TFMB, but it's there in, flu in fluoso, which is the anesthetic convulsant. In other words, all the anesthetics, including the anesthetic convulsant, abolish the 613 terahertz peak, but the, uh, the non-anesthetics, which are binding in the same place, does not, do not. Therefore, this uh, 613 terahertz peak must be important for consciousness, and it goes away with anesthesia. And here's another way to look at that, that uh, if you look at, at MAC, that the, these things are, are way over there. And this looks at the frequency shift of the 613 uh, terahertz. So basically, anesthetics take it away, and, uh, and the non-anesthetics do not, despite them being in the same place. So anesthetic action on consciousness correlates with dampening of terahertz oscillations in tubulin, subunit of microtubules. So what does that tell us? So here's the kind of the, the, kind of the big picture that we have. Because um, um, as Max Tegmar pointed out yesterday, we don't operate at uh, 10 to the minus, at 10 to the 21st hertz, or 10 to the minus 21 seconds. Um, however, we do operate, I think, at 10 to the 12th hertz here, even though electrophysiology is down here in hertz and, and maybe 100 hertz. But what happens, so here's the terahertz oscillations in the, in the pi resonance dipoles in tubulin. So let's start here. We have a pyramidal cell. We take one microtubule, and then we take a row of microtubules. We have these collective dipoles across these, uh, this row of uh, tubulins, which, by the way, follow the Fibonacci geometry around the microtubule. And, we and, uh, and then we get down to the individual dipoles, and the anesthetic blocks these dipole oscillations. So that's the point. The anesthetics block the terahertz oscillations down at the nitty-gritty level of, tera, uh, of 10 to the uh, 12 hertz, and that slows everything else down, going uh, upwards in scale and faster. So we, we think that there's a, uh, this kind of ca hierarchical cas frequency cascade, which to me is more like music than computation, with interference beats uh, uh, occurring at, at various uh, uh, frequency levels. And in fact, in our recent paper, uh, Roger came up with the idea that interference beats may give rise to EEG. Now, uh, EEG has been used for 100 years and is very useful clinically, but nobody really knows where it comes from and why specific bands uh, correlate with this or that, and how it's globally coherent over the whole brain. Uh, despite its clinical utility, it's still somewhat of a mystery. So we propose that EEG is actually an interference beat coming, uh, beats coming from faster vibrations in microtubules inside all those neurons, because all those neurons, including the pyramidal cells from which EEG uh, comes from, have microtubules within them oscillating in megahertz and so forth, uh, megahertz, kilohertz, uh, gigahertz, 
So terahertz, gigahertz, megahertz, and kilohertz. Now, there, this is experimentally supported by the work of uh, An Anurban Banjapati and his uh, uh, colleagues in Japan, who uh, applied nanotechnology at ambient temperatures to neurons here using electrodes, and then individual microtubules, and then, and then rows of tubulins, and found these, uh, th what they did was they applied uh, alternating current and, and measured conductivity. And the microtubules is a good insulator uh, but when you apply alternating current, they found that at certain critical uh, frequencies of applied uh, AC, the microtubule became highly conductive, almost superconductive. And they then plotted these frequencies, these resonant frequencies, and they found very self-similar triplet patterns going from, I'll start here at the bottom, in terahertz, gigahertz, and megahertz from individual tubulins, then moving up to a microtubule, gigahertz, megahertz, and kilohertz, and then moving up to the level of neurons, megahertz, kilohertz, and hertz. So if you, you can uh, put those all together, and that's how we came up with this graph of, of this cascade of, uh, megahertz, of uh, terahertz, gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz, and hertz oscillations, uh, uh, skipping rough, roughly uh, uh, three orders of magnitude, but uh, having self-similar patterns, suggesting some kind of resonant hierarchy going from terahertz all the way up to EEG, and maybe even slower. Okay, so how does this relate to consciousness? Why would this cause consciousness? And for that, I'm gonna turn back to the measurement problem and bring in Roger's work. And uh, as you all know, uh, quantum objects can be in superposition of multiple states or locations simultaneously. For example, Schrodinger's cat, both dead and alive. This is the, the example uh, common used to resolve this paradox. But first, what is superposition? And Roger mentioned this uh, in, his, in his talk, but basically uh, he, he equated uh, 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 space-time curvature to mass position. And he used these two-dimensional space-time sheet sheets in his uh, book, The Emperor's New Mind, uh, in 1989, which I read and was heavily influenced by. And uh, he basically said that uh, a particle in this position would be this curvature. If you move the particle, it's this curvature. And, and a particle oscillating between two positions would be basically space-time curvature uh, oscillating, back, uh, oscillating between, uh, between two locations in space-time. And a superposition, therefore, would be both curvatures, with a particle in both positions at the same time, and two curvatures. Now, you might imagine that, okay, you might imagine that, uh, uh, okay, why don't we see definite states in our perceived world? Well, the conscious observer effect, uh, let me just go back and say that, I think I missed one slide, which is kind of, well, maybe not. If, if these continued, you would, if each curvature continued, you get uh, multiple universes. So um, um, we have the conscious observer effect where the observer uh, supposedly causes collapse. This has been around for a long time and has some proponents nowadays, but it puts consciousness outside of science. Consciousness becomes some mysterious entity and uh, outside of science. It doesn't answer the question. Multiple worlds um, in which the space-time curvatures would separate and bifurcate, uh, but uh, it's popular, but in my view, untestable and unnecessary. And uh, if you have collapse, self-collapse in particular, uh, the bone pilot wave, which may guide uh, uh, particles and uh, where to go. And there's actually been models of uh, a Bohmian uh, microtubule uh, effects. Uh, decoherence, but I think uh, uh, this may be encompassed by Penrose objective reduction because it's happening in the universe all around us. And what Max Tegmark was saying yesterday, decoherence acting as an observer, he may just be parroting what Roger's been saying about objective reduction. And then finally, wave function self-collapse, where objective reduction is, causes or is consciousness, where we have this superposition separation. Oh, here it is. If these separations were to continue, we'd have multiple worlds and parallel universes. But instead, what happens at time t equals h over g, which is the indeterminacy principle, at this time, there's a self-collapse. One disappears, and this one continues. Bing, and this is a moment of conscious awareness. So instead of consciousness causing collapse, collapse or self-collapse by objective reduction causes consciousness. Now these would be occurring uh, everywhere, ubiquitous, random, and proto-conscious like decoherence and would have some uh, subject subjectivity but would be random and, and no memory and not really add up to anything and therefore somewhat like uh, uh, panpsychism. Um, and the point is that objective reduction is the only specific mechanism for consciousness ever proposed other than hand-waving uh, arguments and, and emergence theory without any specifics. 
So, uh, but Roger needed a quantum computational mechanism which could orchestrate these, these, in, uh, these processes, terminate by objective reduction, and regulate functional neuronal and synaptic activities. And the answer I proposed to him, and he agreed, was microtubules, and we teamed up uh, in the early 90s. Here we are after the first Tucson conference in, in, in the Grand Canyon. There's Roger, there's Jeff Collickson, David Chalmers, a few other people, there's me. And we began to cook up this theory, which basically says that when you reach a threshold for objective, for objective reduction, here, there's a conscious moment which correlates with something happening in space-time geometry. We approach the hard problem of what, the qualia, the redness of the rose, by saying uh, the conventional views would say that, that uh, Bing was happening due to pa pattern of activity. We would say that it's due to uh, reproducing or perhaps entangling with the particular configuration of space-time geometry that corresponds to the redness of the rose. And we have a sequence of, of moments, uh, bing, 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 at, for example, 40 hertz, or it could be much, much faster, along with backward time effects, uh, which comes from Aharonov and also uh, supported by Libet's experiments of backward information, which I think is, is necessary for free will because the activity that happens when we act consciously happens after we've acted, which causes neuroscientists to say that consciousness is epiphenomenal, which I think is a mistake. Um, and uh, so, the OR occurs by E equals H over T. Uh, this is some, uh, we considered uh, superposition at three levels, and the dominant effect turns out to be atomic nuclei. Uh, the Fermi length uh, separation, uh, 10 of the, uh, uh, of superposition separation, gives a dominant effect that's going to control the objective reduction. And um, uh, some problems and criticisms with or OR that have arisen over the years. Um, um, for example, the qubit is unrealistic. The conformational change, which we had in the original, was due to electron, uh, was unfeasible, and we actually didn't need that. It was a nice cartoon, but it's been replaced by these dipole oscillations, which are more like uh, topological or geometric uh, qubits, and there's no conformational change. The, uh, uh, the 86 pi clouds are acting collectively, and uh, the, it's enough to move the nuclei for all those atoms uh, by their diameter due to the Mossbauer effect or some other effect, and it gives rise to uh, geometric uh, qubits, topological qubits, perhaps. The second, the uh, brain too warm, wet, and noisy, uh, 25 milliseconds too long to avoid decoherence. And Max Tegmark, uh, is he here? Max? So Max said that um, uh, uh, decoherence, uh, he calculated decoherence for microtubule at 10 to the minus 13 seconds, 10 to the 21st, minus 21 for a whole neuron, 10 to the minus 13 for uh, a, a microtubule. But he used a superposition separation, which is in the denominator of his decoherence time, of 24 nanometers based on uh, soliton moving along three, uh, three tubulins, whereas we use the Fermi length, and this was a, an error of seven orders of magnitude, uh, compared to uh, uh, what we had proposed. And uh, uh, Scott Hagen, Jack Jasinski, and I used Max's own decoherence formula, corrected the separation. We found two other uh, errors of, uh, accounting for two more orders of magnitude, and calculated 10 to the minus 4 seconds, and we published results one year later in the same journal, Phys Rev E. Um, and the 10 to the minus 4th coherence time has been experimentally shown by Bandyapati, as I showed you previously. And it turns out we don't actually need that fast. So here's the 10, uh, the 10 to the minus fourth uh, would be uh, kilohertz. So it turns out we don't need that fast because if, if uh, orca wire is happening here, um, which would give too few uh, neurons, uh, in our 2014 paper, we suggested orca wire could occur at, for example, 10 megahertz, and that interference uh, slightly different could, could, uh, could give rise to slower beat frequency. So we only really need uh, terahertz or maybe uh, t megahertz, maybe even terahertz, which we already know happens. And uh, this would require a lot more tubulins, and which makes a lot more sense, 10 of the 6 neurons, uh, which is predicted by other models. And then altered states, for example, the, the pi resonance uh, groups of the psychedelics and so forth might increase the frequency and push, push, uh, push it the other way. So we'd be, it'd be kind of the opposite of anesthesia, so we have enhanced consciousness. So in conclusion, um, Orca Warge, in uh, 1998, uh, we wrote uh, uh, 20 testable predictions, which were reviewed in 2014. Six have been validated, none refuted. 
Um, experimental evidence uh, uh, supports OCOR from anesthesia and quantum vibrations. Uh, Meyer Overton quantum underground pervades living systems, and uh, life may be intrinsically a quantum, quantum biological effect at its root. Uh, covering neurobiology, quantum physics, relativity, and philosophy, OCOR, I claim, is the most complete and verified theory of consciousness yet performed yet put forth it hasn't been uh, severely challenged, including by Max's uh, incorrect uh, assertions. And uh, addressing quantum vibrations and microtubules offer therapeutic opportunities for mental and cognitive disorders. For example, we're, uh, we're doing clinical trials of putting ultrasound megahertz into the brain uh, for dementia and traumatic brain injury and uh, opioid addiction. And we'll uh, stay tuned for that. And finally, let me just mention the, con the conference that Jan kindly mentioned, uh, which will be coming up in April. And you should all come. Thank you very much.